previously on Accused. But I can't he, think he would just go into that furnace all by himself. No one ever gave us any indication or reason to believe that foul play may have occurred. A lot of people said, well, he jumped in there, he committed suicide. No. No, he did not. He was probably lowered into the furnace that he was probably murdered. So I need to actually look into this person. What's this person's name? I can take all the stuff off. I need to be able to... Drop the camera. Yeah, that's fine. And the recording. I'm Amber Hunt, and this is Accused, the mysterious death of David Box. Reporting any cold case is tough, but this one has presented some unique challenges. For starters, everyone's sick, which has made setting up interviews difficult. Harry Easterling was undergoing dialysis three times a week. Mel Carnes brought a cardiac support dog to our interview. Two unrelated people, one an employee, one the widow of a former employee, had dementia. It's not surprising, maybe, when you remember that David Box disappeared 35 years ago, and the people who worked alongside him were at least in their 30s back then, not to mention exposed for years to cancer-causing elements. But the most unnerving moment involved a man whose father had been David's supervisor. This man, named Charles Schaus after his dad, though the younger Schaus went by middle name Michael, seemed happy to set up an interview when I called him. He even volunteered some info before I said I was calling about a death at the plant. Dad was supervisor when Dave Box disappeared. We set up an in-person interview at his home for the following week. My producer, engineer, and I showed up at the designated time, but Michael's wife said he had forgotten about our appointment and would have to reschedule. He never returned the handful of phone messages I had left or emails I'd sent. And then I learned that there was a reason. On June 4th, 2019, Charles Michael Schaus died by suicide. If I were D.C. Cole, this would be another piece to the conspiracy puzzle. But no, I don't think that. I've learned from a relative that Michael, himself a former Fernald employee, had endured chronic pain for years. I've no reason to think the timing of his suicide had anything to do with the timing of our interview. What all this does mean is that the window to officially re-examine this case is rapidly narrowing, so we feel a special sense of urgency to lay out what we've uncovered. Whoever wrote the anonymous 12-page letter to David Box's daughter after the story of her father's death appeared on Unsolved Mysteries had something in common with investigative reporter D.C. Cole. They both seemed to believe that absolutely everyone who could be a part of a cover-up was part of a cover-up. The letter describes Fernald workers as a family. It specifies that the Department of Energy officials and managers in general were not part of this family. Rather, it was a, quote, close-knit group of workers who would do anything for one another, end quote. Apparently, that includes murder. The letter states, quote, Your father was aware of the intolerable drug problem, along with the failure of DOE and NLO to protect the workers, environment, and neighbors, end quote. Those were the two distinct motives the letter writer provided for murder that David was anti-drug and had perhaps caught someone using on sight, and also that he had tried to quit the night he died because no one would listen to him about lax safety conditions, and someone decided to silence his complaints once and for all. Eventually, Casey Box Drake, David's daughter, came to believe that D.C. Cole wrote this letter himself. She accused him of as much in a tersely worded email she wrote during their late 1990s falling out. Cole denied it. I tried to match up writing styles between the type letter and Cole's book. The letter writer mistakenly uses conscious for conscience, for example. But I couldn't find much overlap. Unless someone steps forward, I don't see how we'll ever know the author. The allegations in the letter are worth examining, though, even if they're anonymous, because those allegations mirror Cole's, and Cole's book, if you'll remember, is housed in the Library of Congress. 
It's as close to an on-the-record rebuttal to police's suicide theory as we've got. So here it goes. Both Cole and the letter writer find it significant that David's last shift was largely spent inside Plant 8. As Cole told Unsolved Mysteries, Plant 8 had released four times more radioactive contaminants into the environment than any other plant at the plant site. According to the Department of Energy, Plant 8 was a scrap recovery plant. The gist is that the rest of the buildings processed and refined and shaped uranium, and all of the leftovers from those buildings were shipped to Plant 8. Tiny bits of uranium were salvaged from waste streams and recycled. In short, uranium was too valuable to squander, and Plant 8 is where all the waste from the rest of the buildings went so that any uranium residue could be collected and reused. The letter writer, who seems to have been familiar enough with the plant to know precise directions to things like the men's locker room, alleges that David was frustrated by the conditions in Plant 8. David and other workers knew it to be particularly unsafe, the letter states. It continues, quote, He was tired of reporting the repair of items that couldn't be repaired. He was tired of being threatened in order that secrecy would be ensured. He was tired of working at a government facility that operated on the basis of lies, theft of taxpayer monies, and major cover-ups that included several federal agencies that ranged as far as the presidency, end quote. It's a bold claim, one that Cole co-signs in his book. We haven't found much evidence that David was quite this upset about the safety issues at work, though. He might have been, but if so, he didn't mention it to his ex-wife or his children, But then again, he wasn't supposed to talk to them about his job at all. There are a few circumstantial tidbits to point to whistleblowing at least being possible. First, here's Harry Easterling in 1994. Dave was a fairly quiet guy, but if you worked on a job and uh, say it was high radiation level, Dave would tell you, say, you know, that particular dust collector is fairly radioactive, so watch yourself, or that pump has a certain kind of acid in it, so be careful when you work on it. Also, in the police file, there's a notation that David in recent months had been treated for a few work injuries. Most recently, he saw a doctor in February 1984 for a burn on the right side of his neck. A month earlier, he was treated for a steam burn on his right wrist and thumb. Maybe these are nothing, but then again, when someone starts getting hurt they might start opening their mouths more. Finally, David's kids told us that their dad was a stickler for the rules. And his supervisor, Charlie Schaus, told police that David spoke up about coworkers sleeping on the job. So maybe it stands to reason that he'd be willing to put his neck out about the plant safety issues. I'm comfortable David hadn't been compiling documentation at home because his ex-wife, Carlene, was the first to gain access after his disappearance, and she found nothing of the sort. She noticed the stocked fridge and new cartons of cigarettes, but no manila folders full of Silkwood-style evidence. Carlene, David's brother Peter, and the older kids took turns staying in David's house in the days after he vanished in hopes of being there if he wandered in. Police came in and searched at some point, but the family had been there first. Now, you ask people with Fernald connections about David Box, and you get as many culprit combinations as a game of Clue. Mel Carnes named one when the cameras weren't rolling. Some former employees mentioned that same person, too, while others pointed to someone else entirely. We don't let ourselves get attached to any specific theory because we don't want to be hypocrites. We want to keep our minds open rather than subject this case to another round of confirmation bias. But other people have been much less concerned about that. Take Cole, for example. In his book, he suggested that each of the following people should have been more thoroughly investigated. Carpool buddy Harry Easterling, supervisor Charlie Schaus, fellow pipe fitter Mel Carnes, and Santa Claus. Oh wait, strike that last one. The letter writer also points to Easterling and Schaus. Carnes didn't make the cut. The finger pointing at Harry seems a bit odd, and I know he was aware that there had been some speculation about him. In fact, when I first called him, his wife answered and was a bit leery about putting him on the phone. I I remember hearing a comment back uh, when this all happened that the kids 
had made a comment about my husband being involved. So I didn't know why, why they, you know, you were trying to find him. For the record, I think she's conflating the kids and Cole. It's the latter who opined Harry's involvement. The kids don't rule him out, but only because they don't feel they should rule anyone out. The letter writer's logic for suspecting Harry was hard to follow, but it went something like this. Harry got too worried too quickly when David didn't show up to meet at White Castle, so the worry must have been an act. I'm not sure I agree. Harry didn't panic when David failed to show up for the drive back to his car after his last shift. He told police that he figured David had either snared some overtime and forgotten to tell him, or he'd sneaked off somewhere to take a nap. He tried to get David on the phone the next day before their subsequent shift, and David never answered. So, by the time Harry found David's car parked in the same spot at White Castle, its hood still cold, he had reason to start worrying. His buddy hadn't surfaced for more than 12 hours at that point. The letter writer and D.C. Cole both pointed to Harry. To Cole's credit, he didn't make that a secret. The guy was bold, if nothing else. Here's Harry speaking in late October when I reached out with some follow-up questions. One thing that bothered me was that loudmouth reporter guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What what about him was bothersome, besides the loudmouth part? He was a pain in the butt. <laughs> Did he ever accuse you? Yeah. That didn't sit well with Harry, who, for the record, told me he had nothing to do with David's disappearance. Carnes was never even mentioned by name in the initial police investigation, so I'm not sure why Cole latched onto him as someone worth considering. Carnes over the years has faced some legal financial troubles, but never anything felonious that I could find. The letter writer says security personnel saw David and Shouse chatting in the blue pickup truck assigned to pipe fitters, but it fails to mention that Carnes reportedly saw the same. He told us that back in February 2019 when we interviewed him, and he had told D.C. Cole that nearly 30 years prior. Here's a passage from Cole's book that begins with a quote from Carnes. I was the last person who saw Dave Box alive, and I know who killed him, Carnes immediately said when contacted by telephone. I imagine this is true because he did the same with me. It appears Cole got suspicious after Carnes said that he had worked inside Plant 6 the night of David's last shift. Plant 6 was supposedly abandoned because the salt vat didn't run at night. That's true. But Carnes being a fellow fix-it guy, he supposedly was briefly in Plant 6 to fix a drinking fountain. Cole writes that he confronted Supervisor Schaus and said Schaus had lied about Plant 6 being empty all night. Cole writes that Schaus became visibly shaken during the exchange. Quote, yes, we were working inside Plant 6 on the cooling system earlier that night. End quote. Schaus replied before he started freaking himself out. That's a passage from Cole's book. I don't know what that means. Cole decided he did know, however, and he wrote that the significance of Schaus lying is that now he and Easterling and Carnes can be placed at the scene of the crime. Get it? It's a conspiracy. After Cole quote-unquote confronted Schaus, he confronted Carnes and accused him of lying too. Carnes didn't like this, Cole wrote, and said, No, I know for damn sure I was alone in Plant 6. It reads to me like Carnes didn't like being called a liar, and he was maybe raising his voice a tad because of it, but Cole was certain in his appraisal. He wrote, At this point, one must remember to never show any sign of fear to such people, especially when they are on the verge of losing self-control. Showing vicious dogs fear will only get you bit. I can't say I've ever viewed sources as vicious dogs. I admit I've viewed some journalists that way from time to time, but not sources. I wonder what Cole would think if he knew this little tidbit I learned from the case file. When Fernald officials called police to report a missing person, the first call came from the security office, as you might expect. But the second call came from the legal department. Excuse the break, but I want to tell you about another podcast you might like. It's called The City, and it's an investigative podcast from USA Today. 
This season of The City tells the story of the unlikely battle for the future of Reno, a battle over big tech and strip clubs. Once a tired casino town, Reno has recently caught the attention of Silicon Valley. Now some of the city's most powerful people are looking to cash in. Standing in their way is an aging strip club. City boosters want to kick it out to make way for a new Reno, but the strip club is fighting back. Battles like this one to reshape the city's image and develop its downtown are happening around the country in any city where powerful people court big tech in the name of progress. That's the story told in this season of The City podcast from USA Today. You can subscribe to The City on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening right now. Accused is sponsored by Bolin Branch. My new Bolin Branch sheets have been almost single-handedly getting me through the cold I've had for the last few weeks. They are seriously the softest, most comfortable sheets in the world. They wash really nicely too, which is important to me when I'm thinking about what sheets to buy. If you're in the market for new sheets, it doesn't get any better than Bolin Branch. Besides being insanely comfortable, their products are made in factories that prioritize workers' empowerment and sustainable incomes. And 100% of their packaging is made from recycled paper and can be recycled and or repurposed. Right now, for a limited time, you can get their luxury flannel bedding to keep you cool sleepers warm and, because they breathe, keep the warm sleepers cool. Shipping is always free. You can try them out for 30 nights risk-free. And right now, you get $50 off your first set of sheets at bowlandbranch.com with promo code ACCUSED. That's $50 off at bowlandbranch.com, promo code ACCUSED. Spelled B-O-L-L and branch.com, code ACCUSED. And now back to our story. I found nothing that actually indicates anyone was in Plant 6 besides Carnes, and he wasn't there toward the shift's end. Around 4.45 a.m., after the lunch break, he said he spotted David once again talking to Shouse, this time near Plant 4, where the time clock was. Two brief asides. Cole accused another person of lying, according to his book. That's Detective Pete Alderucci. Cole quotes Alderucci as saying the temperature drop singular, not plural, only lasted a minute or so when the temperature readouts and police's own notes actually show two drops spanning about 15 minutes. Cole does not consider this discrepancy a faulty memory or innocent misstatement. He sees it as Alderucci changing his story and therefore being part of the cover-up. It doesn't look like Alderucci or his colleagues liked being called a liar, though. One of them supposedly told Cole don't fuck with us. The second aside is about a handwritten note in the police file that's never mentioned elsewhere. The note is signed by Charles Schaus, who wrote, quote, I received a phone call at 8.38 p.m. on 6-20-84 that stated, Bastard, you had better learn that the union runs the company or you or your wife will have an accident, end quote. The caller then hung up. A notation indicates Schaus got this call at home, not at work, I have no idea if the phone call was connected to David's disappearance, but it seems noteworthy that it happened during David's first missed shift, and it's in the file concerning his disappearance. Here's some more about Schaus. He placed himself with David about the same time Carnes says he saw them together. In fact, you might remember from last episode that Schaus told police that he stood near a freight elevator trying to get David to open up to him and tell him why he seemed so down. It might not be fair, but something about this bugs me. Ten minutes is a long time to talk to someone who supposedly isn't responding. Anyone who's been depressed, or even just blue, surely knows what it feels like to not want to talk about it. And most probably have had a friend or two try a bit too hard to pry. Imagine being on the receiving end of this for ten full minutes. It would feel like an eternity. There are a few other things Shao said that I'd really like to clarify as well. In trial to have David declared dead, he testified that he and Harry had a conversation during lunch about how morose David seemed. The scene he painted was a little odd, in fact, because it sounded like David was right there in the room and Shouse and Harry were talking about him as though he weren't. 
Shouse testified that the only lunch conversation was about David's obvious depression. The thing is, that doesn't line up with the transcripts of Harry's 1984 police interviews. In fact, he said the opposite. Detective Henry Schaefer asked Harry, but there was no anything in particular, any type of conversation to indicate that maybe he was, you know, depressed or anything of that nature? Harry replied, no. In the trial I referenced, Cincinnati lawyer Stephen Martin, who represented David's family, asked Charles Schaus about the lunch break he, Harry, and David took together around 4 a.m. Martin specifically wanted to know what the trio talked about over the break, if anything. Charles replied, actually, David Box. He said he asked Harry if he'd noticed anything concerning about David's behavior. Quote, he indicated to me that Dave Box had been acting funny for a couple weeks, and he stated that Dave was getting worse, end quote. Harry didn't testify at the trial where Shouse recounted this conversation, so he wasn't asked to confirm or deny that it happened. In fact, despite Shouse having never mentioned this conversation himself until that trial, no one there challenged him. Once he said what he said under oath, it was accepted as straight-up fact. Both the defense and the plaintiffs called on experts to argue over whether David was suicidal, and both were asked about the two co-workers who said he was despondent, when, in fact, there was only one. Only Shaus. It's possible that Shaus simply misremembered things and somehow got it in his head that Harry backed his despondent diagnosis for David. People's memories are awful. Casey got the year wrong her dad died. Memories are notoriously unreliable, so it's fair to wonder if Shouse's simply failed him. To find out, I needed to ask him, so I started calling. And calling. And calling. At the tone, please record your message. One time I got a call back from one of his numbers, but the line disconnected before I answered it. I'd left a message fairly recently um, returning a call I had gotten from this number. Another time, I thought I had reached him on the phone, but finding people's phone numbers is as much luck as it is know-how. And I was wondering if I could uh, set up a time to talk with you because I understand you were a manager there for a while. No, my father was a manager. I was a millwright maintenance there. Oh, you were an, I thought you were a supervisor. No, not, not there. I wasn't. My dad was. Oh, you're you're the young one. <laughs> okay, how are you? Yeah, okay, Dad was Dad was supervisor when Dave Box disappeared. Yes, yeah, that's actually part of um, what I've been looking at. Sometimes when you're looking for a phone number, you find a relative's number instead. That's what happened here. The younger Shouse is also Charles, though he goes by Michael. I was just as happy to find him because, as I said, he also was a former Fernald employee, and I'd been interviewing every former worker I could find. It was a logical step to ask Michael Schaus to chat, and I thought maybe it would be a way to get connected with his dad. I mean, maybe D.C. Cole scared the older Schaus off by calling him a liar 30 years ago. Maybe he'd be willing to talk to someone who wants to find answers rather than pin blame. All of this was for naught, of course. As described earlier in this episode, the younger Schaus missed our interview appointment and died in June. I sent condolences to his wife and gave the family some space for several months. Before I knew about the death, I had already made all those phone calls and sent letters to the elder Schaus's home, to a rental property he owns, and to an ex-wife of his. Starting in October, I began calling again, and in mid-November, Amanda and I went to his house to knock on the door. It was important we give him as clear an opportunity to talk to us as possible. Hi, I'm Amber. I'm a reporter with The Enquirer. I've been trying to reach Charlie Schaus uh, for a story that I'm putting together looking at Fernald. He's in bed. Okay, I'll, I'll leave my number then. Okay. It seems he doesn't want to talk to us. I'd, of course, still like to ask about the statements that don't line up for me, but I don't know if I'll ever get the chance. While Charlie Schaus hasn't responded to my many attempts to reach him, Harry Easterling did. And because Schaus had described a conversation that he supposedly had with Harry, I was able to ask Harry if he remembered this conversation. 
So I, I just want to make sure that I'm totally clear on this. Um, when you and Charlie had lunch, did you guys did you guys talk about anything over the lunch break? Just about where he was going, going somewhere. I don't know if there were Kings Island or someplace. That's with David. But did you talk to Charlie about anything? He was kind of in the conversation. Okay. Did you ever feel at any point in the investigation, did you ever tell anyone that you thought David was depressed? Nope. Do you know that in some of the trials, it is accepted as fact that you did think he was depressed? No, I don't think he was. Joyce, Harry's wife, was married to him back in 1984 and has talked with her husband at length about his memories of that day. She knows the case well, or at least as well as a third party without access to transcripts and police memos can. She watched him get interviewed by Unsolved Mysteries and went to Tennessee, where the TV crew filmed a wonderfully cheesy reenactment of David's last moments. Harry had some health problems, so Joyce was on the phone call with us in case brain fog made it tough to understand a question. My question about the lunchtime conversation seemed to confuse her. Same that they had a conversation without Dave Fox there? Well, supposedly, um, it actually looks like David might have even been in the room, the way that Charlie describes it. But, but the gist is that Charlie testifies that Harry and he talked about how depressed David was during that last lunch. Harry shaking his head no. I don't think he was. And you never thought that? No. Based on the times given by David's various co-workers, Carnes wasn't the last person to see David alive, as he believes. Schaus put himself with David at 5.15 a.m., which is interesting. That's the same time that the printout from Plant 6 suggests David went into the vat. And what's even weirder is that I found a notation in a police memo that actually stated the vat clock was about 10 minutes fast, which would mean that David was in Plant 6 disintegrating in salt a few minutes earlier than Shao supposedly saw him near Plant 4. Something there doesn't add up. It could be that clocks weren't synced or someone wasn't great at estimating time, but it occurred to me that usually when someone is placed near someone else at the time of their death, the surviving person would generally be expected to answer a few questions of the did you have any reason to cause him harm variety. Shouse wasn't asked such questions. Shouse also told people Harry described David as despondent when Harry didn't. And Shouse circled back to police to add something to his story that's never been reported before. After his initial interview, Shouse told investigators that he remembered an encounter with David early in the shift that, in hindsight, bothered him. He said that soon after David arrived with Harry at work, Schaus arrived in Plant 12, where the employees always got their work assignments for the day. It was between 12.15 and 12.20, Schaus said. But when Schaus showed up at Plant 12 to hand out the assignments, David wasn't there. Schaus testified, quote, And I asked Harry Easterling if he had seen Dave, and he said no. So I called him on the radio, and he said he was south of Plant 5, end quote. David had no reason to be wandering, and this was a facility that at least paid lip service to security. So Schaus asked David what he was doing. He said David replied that he was getting some fresh air. Schaus said he told David to sit tight and then hopped in his maintenance truck and drove out to pick him up. When Schaus spotted him, David was walking back from Plant 6. Schaus, in hindsight, believed that David had meant to kill himself then, around midnight and only got another chance after the lunch break. This description is counter to Harry's statements, though. According to Harry, he and David arrived to work together, changed in the locker room together, clocked in together in Plant 4, walked to Plant 12 together, and then awaited their assignments together. Here's me talking to Harry again. Did David leave you at any point during that period? No. Um... So when was the first time he was out of your vicinity at that point? The truth, I don't remember. Do you know, would it have been before or after you guys got your assignments? 
that had been after. So you're pretty comfortable that he wasn't gone at some point before he was handed an assignment? Correct. It is, of course, possible that Harry's memory is faulty. But Harry seemed fine telling me when he didn't remember something. Here he is the first time we talked. You're going to have to forgive me because I, I have had a stroke and I can't, I can't remember everything. I understand and no worries. Even, even if you didn't have a medical issue, this is a long time ago. I don't expect pristine memories. Well, that's memories. true, but it, to me it feels like yesterday. Excuse this quick break. The episode you're listening to now was released already on our Patreon page at patreon.com slash accused. You can get early ad-free episodes there, as well as bonus episodes, behind-the-scenes peeks, Q&A sessions, and even a brand new crime and journalism podcast. If you like what we do here, consider joining us over there. Again, for this content and more, support us at patreon.com slash accused. In 2008, a former D1 football star pulled off a robbery so daring and so strange that it went viral worldwide. It was a perfect crime story. There was just one problem. It wasn't the real story of what happened. The Sneak is a new, serialized true crime podcast from For the Win and USA Today Sports, streaming only on Wondery Plus. Subscribe at wondery.com slash plus. And now back to our story. It feels worth mentioning that after the Unsolved Mysteries episode aired and police did circle back to interview Carnes and some others, a handwritten note says they were told to talk to Shouse because, quote, he knows a lot more than what he's saying, end quote. But no one ever did talk to Shouse. Do you think that it is worth looking at that possibility? Um, the... It's always worth talk, talking to somebody. It doesn't hurt to interview somebody or re-interview somebody if you have new information. Sure, anytime that works. Um, possibly, I know some of the detectives that are there now, they may want to. Um, you know, I can't get involved in it, of course, myself. No, yeah. But yeah, they may. I, I wouldn't ever you know, not turn down the chance to interview somebody if you get new information. It's not new information exactly, but once you realize Harry never thought of David as despondent, you're forced to face that police base their suicide theory largely on one man's opinion, and that one man just so happens to be the last person to have seen David alive. He even puts himself with David at the time of death. It seems worthy of some questions. Now, Carnes is quick to say David was killed that night, and he'll even tell you his theory when the cameras aren't rolling. But he doesn't agree with either the letter writer or D.C. Cole's belief that David died to thwart his planned whistleblowing. Rather, Carnes subscribes to another motive based on the, as far as I can tell, unfounded rumor that David's ex-wife had started dating someone at the plant. I found this intriguing at first because it's statistically far more likely that someone would be killed for love or sex than killed as part of a huge governmental cover-up. I asked David's kids about this, and they're not only adamant that it isn't true, but they said it couldn't have happened. Carlene, their mother, was no longer with David when he got the job at Fernald in 1981. She had never been to a company event, never visited David at work, current spouses didn't know much about the company. So it stands to reason an ex-wife would know even less. She also lived farther from Fernald than David did. On top of all that, Casey remembers her mom's boyfriend from that time period because she was dating a younger man whose best friend ended up marrying Casey. The two are divorced now, but it's kind of hard to forget that time your mom dated your husband's best friend. I don't think this relationship rumor is remotely founded, but I do wonder if there's an element of Karn's suspicion that's worth exploring. The timing of David's death seems too close to the news breaking about the plant's lack safety record to be a coincidence. But what if it were? What if David had been killed for something far more pedestrian, more predictable? The drugs question, for example. I know my dad was 
way against drugs. Like I said, when my younger brother got busted at school for having weed, he wanted to get custody. He thought, you know, my younger brother was gonna be some heroin addict within a week, you know, cause he had weed on him at school. This experience left her kids with the impression that dad was four square in the Just Say No camp. That could be a possible possibility of what happened. It might not be about the uranium leaks. It could be that he happened to find out about the dope. To be clear, as outsiders, we can't know for sure that drugs were sold at Fernald. I tried to pull police records to learn about any drug bust there, but the plant was federally owned and staffed its own security. Police didn't do anything there unless they were asked. The front gate was guarded by a man with a big gun. We have heard this drug allegation from multiple former employees, though, and others said similar things during oral history interviews with the Fernald Community Alliance in the late 1990s. Also, to be clear, even if drugs were sold there, it's possible David and these drugs never intersected. But it seems worth the question. If David had stumbled on anything of the sort, he had already proven himself to be willing to complain about his co-workers breaking rules. He had recently gotten someone suspended for sleeping on the job, after all. If David had spotted drugs, it's not inconceivable that he might have threatened to tell bosses. And, considering this was federal property, anyone involved with drug use or sales surely was at risk of losing their security clearances and their jobs. When police investigate crimes, they're taught to consider who had the means, the motive, and the opportunity. Nearly everyone who worked at Fernald during David's last shift had the means and opportunity. Over the past 14 months, we've found several possible motives worth pursuing. We've done as much as we've been able to, but we're journalists. No matter how hard we work on these cases, there's a limit to what we can do. We can't issue subpoenas or execute search warrants. We can only hope that the people in power consider what we've uncovered and take it from there. It's been more than 35 years, and many of the people with information in this case are sick. The clock is ticking. Next time on Accused. You know, the rules right now say that it has to stay, stay in the federal government's ownership. There were threats around here that they keep it up, no, nobody will have a job, and they kind of used that as leverage. And they didn't like us at all. It was, it was quite phenomenal, and there were metal materials. It was a junkyard. A, think in terms of a giant radioactive junkyard. To binge this season, go to www.wondery.com plus. That's W-O-N-D-E-R-Y dot com slash P-L-U-S. To support the creators of Accused directly, go to our Patreon page where donors get bonus content and early episodes. That's at patreon.com slash accused. This is a special project from the Cincinnati Enquirer, part of the USA Today Network, narrated by Amber Hunt, produced by Amanda Rossman, engineered by Phil Didion, and edited by Amy Wilson. Intern Mark Rosenberg provided additional research. Music was composed by Andrew Higley. To look at case documents, photos, videos, and more, visit accusedpodcast.com. As noted, some audio comes from a living history project from the Fernald Community Alliance. Transcript to those interviews are available at fernaldcommunityalliance.org. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, check out these other videos from USA Today to stay up to date with all the latest news.